Hello, I'm Nikola Tesla. I would like to describe to you what electricity is. The day when we shall know exactly what electricity is will chronicle an event probably greater, more important, than any other recorded in the history of the human race. What is electricity, and what is magnetism? We are now confident that electric and magnetic phenomena are attributable to the ether, and we are perhaps justified in saying that the effects of static electricity are effects of ether in motion. We may speak of electricity or of an electric condition, state or effect. We must distinguish two such effects, opposite in character and neutralizing each other, for in a medium of the properties of the ether, we cannot possibly exert a strain or produce a displacement or motion of any kind, without causing in the surrounding medium an equivalent and opposite effect. Its condition determines the positive and negative character. We know that it acts like an incompressible fluid, the electromagnetic theory of light and all facts observed teach us that electric and ether phenomena are identical. The puzzling behavior of the ether as a solid to waves of light and heat, and as a fluid to the motion of bodies through it, is certainly explained in the most natural and satisfactory manner by assuming it to be in motion, as Sir William Thompson has suggested. Nor can anyone prove that there are transverse ether waves emitted from an alternate current machine, to such slow disturbances, the ether, if at rest, may behave as a true fluid A. Hello, I'm Walter Russell. I would like to explain gravity to you. Gravitation is the generative force of increasing potential and the regenerative force of decreasing potential. Gravitation is the power within the electric force of action to attract the electric force of action. Gravitation is the contractive power within electricity to divert the universal constant of energy into centripetal vortices of closing spirals of increasing speed, thereby attracting similar states of motion into an accumulation of mass, the pressure of which increases toward its center. Gravitation is an expression of the power of electricity to accumulate by induction and, by so doing, to force magnetism to increase its resistance to that accumulation. Gravitation is the electric, inductive force. Gravity is evidenced wherever compression from without is maximum. Gravity is a focal point from which matter desires to explode outwardly. Gravity does not pull inwardly from within as the deceptive illusion of nature would have you believe. Neither is it the attractive force which Newton's senses were deceived into believing, for a center of gravity is a point of maximum electric potential. Gravity never changes. It is never more or less. It is maximum everywhere. It is electric potential which changes by multiplying and dividing the measure of power it is able to express by drawing it from its gravity center of control. It is like the power of a man who can draw but little from the great omnipotence which centers him, as compared with another man whose knowledge enables him to draw more of it. Electric potential is the tension caused by the electric division of the one universal condition of rest into two unbalanced conditions of motion. My name is John Keeley. Here are some of my thoughts and findings concerning ether. The luminiferous ether, the compound inerethoric element, in other words, celestial mind force, is the substance of which all visible and invisible things are composed. Ether is an atomolic liquid 986,000 times the density of steel. Taking into consideration even the introductory conditions of the etheric stage, etheric vibration has proved to me that the higher the velocity of its rotating stream the greater is its tendency towards the neutral center or center of sympathetic coincidence. Were it otherwise, how could there ever be any planetary formations of the building up of visible structure? If a billiard ball were rotated to a certain velocity, it would separate in pieces, and the pieces would fly off in a tangent, but if it were a ball of ether, the higher the velocity of rotation the stronger would be the tendency of its corpuscles to seek its center of neutrality, and to hold together. The fundamental mode of vibration changes as we reach the fifth subdivision, of matter, to the dominant, the diatonic third of the mass chord, which controls the vibratory states of both the etheron and inner etheron.
The awful might concealed in the depths of the etheric and inner-etheric subdivisions utterly transcends anything science has ever known. Even the theoretical energy value of radium now accepted by science, pales into insignificance in comparison to the energy value of an equal amount of water subdivided to the etheric or inner-etheric state. There are ample writings acknowledging that there is unlimited energy in the universe, but to say one is able to tap this supply is another matter. If I tell you there is water, good cold water, in a glass on your table, but you cannot drink it for a million years, what would you think? You know how to get the water out of a glass. Well, it is as easy to tap this energy now out in space as it will be in a million years from now. If it can be done then, it can be done now. For me to go into a technical account of how to harness this energy, would mean the writing of volumes. The whole thing might be said in the few words of Nikola Tesla, throughout space there is energy. Is this energy static or kinetic? If static our hopes are in vain, if kinetic and this we know it is for certain, then it is a mere question of time when men will succeed in attaching their machinery to the very wheelwork of nature. This I have been able to do through the use of certain valves and oscillators that I have made and of which doctors of science have said are the most powerful devices known to science today. When an elastic substance is subjected to strain and then set free, one of two things happens. The substance may slowly recover from the strain and gradually attain its natural state, or the elastic recoil may carry it past its position of equilibrium and cause it to execute a series of oscillations. In ordinary language there may be a continuous flow of energy in one direction until the discharge is completed, or an oscillating discharge may occur. That is, the first flow may be succeeded by a backrush, as if the first discharge had overrun itself and something like a recoil set in. The device thus becomes more or less charged again in the opposite sense, and a second discharge occurs accompanied by a second backrush, the oscillations going on until the energy is either radiated or used up in the heating of the conductors. And if your device will oscillate in harmony with the oscillations of the universe, or in other words, if the device is capable of synchronization with the vibrations of that energy through space, then the oscillations will go on forever. No one can call such an arrangement perpetual motion any more than one can call the motion of the earth perpetual motion. My device oscillates because of the oscillations of the universe caused by the disintegration of matter. The inertia line is the axis of the wave. It is the line of equilibrium between opposing pressures. All effects of motion are repetitive. Repetitive means reproductive. Energy reproduces itself in repetitive units. The entire universe is but a repetition of these spiral wave units in varying dimensions. Energy does not travel. It reproduces. This is a universe of reproduction. Energy is constant. It has no variation. All of the energy of the universe is back of all of the motion of the universe. The apparent variability of energy is due solely to variability of dimension. Time dimension decreases its speed in favor of power dimension of higher potential. Hi, I am Victor Schauberger. I would like to briefly describe my discovery. Arising from an exhaustive and in-depth observation of nature, my discovery consists in the fact that all life and growth is shaped and fashioned through vibration and movement. This naturalesque form of motion I finally discovered after decades of research and countless series of experiments. It is the creative curving form of motion found in nature that I have come to describe as cycloid space curve motion, which in more common language is perhaps more easily understandable as a life curve, curve of nature, or even as a bio curve. Furthermore, I have also devoted considerable time and effort to translating these forms of motion and dynamic shapes, faithfully copied from nature, into terms of mechanics. In this I succeeded and it provided me with the basis for my biotechnology. Through the naturalesque movement of liquid or gaseous substances, e.g. water and air, the following arise in nature as well as in my apparatuses, which are neither difficult nor expensive to mass-produce. a. Two different forms of temperature, which I shall refer to as T1 and T2. Conditioned by these temperatures and also closely associated with them, there also arise. b. Two different types of flow, 
which we shall describe as F1 and F2. Through these hitherto unknown forms of temperature and motion the substance in question, i.e. water or air, is decomposed, transformed and built up. In this way, through appropriate regulation, elemental energies are freed. Suctional and pressural forces come into being, which in my apparatuses evolve along a common developmental axis and represent an entirely new means of motion and propulsion. If this product of synthesis, almost exclusively composed of geospheric energies, is atomized and atmospheric oxygen simultaneously infused through nozzles, viz. other forms of fertilization, thus charging it with fertilizing substances, these become passive at high centripetal velocity, and if this whole mixture is lightly compressed, warmed, by a descending piston, then the mixture is instantaneously transformed into the next higher state of development or aggregation, namely into air. Due to this new organism's roughly 1,700-fold increase in volume, an exploitable expansive pressure equal to about 2,000 atmospheres per liter, 0.264 gallons, of such water is produced. That this tremendous pressure expresses itself silently requires no special comment. That, as a high-grade air, this product of transformation has a more beneficial effect on the environment and development generally than the waste matter of explosive processes, also goes without saying. That this high-grade product of transformed air does not smell, is without doubt. In this way what was striven for has been achieved, namely a far higher exploitable pressure than is produced by any form of petrol, gasoline. Moreover, it is an incombustible pressure-creating substance that neither stinks nor creates a din, and its beneficial effect can be raised to any desired level, so that in practice the smallest quantities are enough to achieve any desired effects. This ideal pressure-producing substance is the driving medium for powering the centrifugal repulsators, which er generate the bioelectromagnetic vacuum, the most powerful suctional force of nature's that could ever be imagined. These centrifugal repulsators are described in the patent application at the Reich's Patent Office in Berlin. Their more detailed description will be undertaken at an appropriate moment in the future. At the end of 1889, after having spent a year working in the workshops of George Westinghouse, in Pittsburgh, I experienced such an enormous longing to resume my interrupted investigations that, despite the tempting proposition that did, I left for New York with the intention of resuming my laboratory work. But, due to the pressing demands of various scientific societies foreigners, I made a trip to Europe where I gave lectures before the Institution of Electrical Engineers and the Royal Institution, in London, and the Société de Physique, in Paris. Later, and after a brief visit to my home in Yugoslavia, I returned to this country in 1892, eager to dedicate myself to the subject that is the predilection of my thoughts, the study of the universe. For the next two years, with intense concentration, I was sufficiently lucky enough to make two powerful discoveries. The first was a dynamic theory of gravity which I have elaborated in all its details and which I hope make it known to the world very soon. Such a theory explains the causes of this force and the movements of the heavenly bodies under its influence so satisfactorily that put an end to vain speculations and false conceptions, such as that of space curved. According to relativists, space has a tendency to curvature, due to a property or inherent characteristic of the stars. Even when I know grant a veneer of truth to this fantastic idea, it contradicts itself. All action is accompanied by an equivalent reaction and the effects of the latter are directly opposite to those of the first. Assuming that the bodies act on the space that surrounds them causing their curvature, to my naive mind it seems that curved spaces must react on bodies and produce the effects opposites, that is, straighten the curves. As action and reaction coexist, concludes that the supposed curvature of space is totally impossible. But even if existed, it would not explain the motions of bodies as they are observed. Only the existence of a force field can account for them, and accepting this implies that it is not necessary to resort to the curvature of space. All the literature on this matter is vain and destined to fall into oblivion. So are all attempts to explain the workings of the universe without acknowledging the existence of the ether and the essential role it plays in phenomena. Man is the consummate manifestation of God's imagining of his very self. God's image in man is not yet complete. The time will come to every man when the light which is God will be known in every man. That white light of God centers every man. Few there are, or have ever been who know that light within them but all men must eventually know that light is their spiritual natures unfold. 